thank you to Globo for trying. Thank you for uh, uh, arranging things last minute. Abel, uh, Alish, uh, Kevin, and others. Thank you for setting this up and for ThoughtWorks for uh, hosting this. And thank you for attending. I recognize some of you um, from maybe November or even before. I, I haven't been to Barcelona too many times, but I'm enjoying it. And uh, I hope to be here more often in the future. So I'm uh, discussing this evening um, reactive DDD. What is reactive? Well, we're going to talk about domain-driven design and reactive, but now this, you know, the sub-theme or the subtitle of this talk is transforming digital business. So we're also going to talk about transformation in the enterprise, trying to take a different perspective of how software is designed. Uh, what does transformation actually mean? Um, I think that transformation can mean, you know, several different things, but hopefully uh, you'll see a way to transform the way you design software, the way that you develop software this evening. So as Alish and uh, Danny mentioned, I'm the chief architect of the Vlingo platform. This is a reactive platform. Um, we have a in production release of uh, in Java, and the .NET version is lagging a bit, but uh, being developed. And um, so we we are um, improving the tools on a regular basis. So I'm going to teach you about uh, the ideas around Vlingo, and then I'll introduce you to some of the the actual tools this evening, and we'll get some help from uh, Alish and. Maybe Brian too. So Brian uh, works for Skyscanner in Barcelona here. He's American who speaks Spanish and Catalan. So give him a hand. Yeah. <laughs> no, really. Yeah. So um, so you can read about Blingo at Blingo.io on the web, and documentation is is at uh, docs.blingo.io. Okay, so, oh, and I have to say too, um, uh, so Kevin Masuris, who works at ThoughtWorks and spoke with me today at, uh, at the conference at JPCM, is a contributor. Alish is a contributor. Um, Abel is a contributor. And there are several in Barcelona who are contributors, so that's awesome. And Brian, the reason Brian knows this stuff is because he's been actually he's he's been using uh, Lingo um, for a number of months now, probably at least six months, something like that. So you can talk to him too about his experience with it. Okay, so let's talk about domain-driven design for a moment. How many here say that you are somewhat familiar with EDD, at least somewhat familiar? Okay, a lot. How many of you would say that you've really used DDD uh, extensively in a project? At least one project. Okay. So that's typical. Um, there's a, there's, we are growing knowledge about DDD, and that's really great. Um, and, but I have to say, you know, you can read about DDD. You can take workshops like mine, of, you know, on DDD. You can attend conferences about DDD but you actually just need to use it. And, and, I, and I have to say, don't be afraid of domain-driven design. Don't uh, make it mysterious to your company, to your organization. Be inviting, be, um, you know, be open about DVD. Maybe you don't even want to use the term DVD around people. Just talk about a way of developing software that, that draws developers and business people closer together. Honestly, the, the, um, the letters, something, anything, you know, question mark, DD, um, whether it's BDD, TDD, you name it, DDD, 
a lot of uh, senior executives, people who manage software development, have gotten burned by the DDs, right? So just be careful. Be careful about over promoting the name until you see results. Results is what matters. It's not. It's not that that you're using something or that you know. I mean, you know, is it is it functional programming that makes you successful? Is it object oriented programming that makes you successful? Is it DDD that makes you successful? It's actually teamwork that makes us successful. All of the other things are tools to, to bring us together. And what DDD helps you to do is understand understand certain uh, tools that can be used to solve hard problems in software. So I encourage you to use it. Every and you know, two of the sort of foundational um, ideas behind domain-driven design uh, are the bounded context and the ubiquitous language. Now. You know, you can say that if you've written aggregates or used value objects in your project that uh, you've been doing domain-driven design. And it's possible that that's true, but really uh, DDD is, is quite, you know, primarily based on the bounded context in Nicholas language and the, and the tactical patterns are kind of secondary. Well, we have a look at both of those. This, this is one of the strategic patterns, the bounded context. And of course, the ubiquitous language inside a bounded context is modeled using technical components from some programming language. Could be Java, could be C sharp, could be Python, um, you know, F sharp, Scala, <coughs> Kotlin, you know, on and on. Right? So we can use the tactical patterns internally. In this case here, what I'm showing you is the idea of actors. And I'll explain actors further in a, in a few moments, but um, notice that I've drawn these diagrams with uh, circular objects instead of the rectangular or square objects that, were, that are commonly seen. Why is this? Because a few reasons, historically, there's uh, a book from the 1970s about the actor model. Um, Gul Akha wrote this book, and he wrote and he drew actors as circles at the time. Okay, and I think that that's a great tradition to start, and uh, or or to carry on um, that he started. And so I draw objects as circles these days. Um, what's an actor? Well, we'll get into that further, but just think of an actor as an object. It's just an object. Don't, you know, let's not make things more complicated than, than they actually are. Actors are objects, and I'll, and I'll tell you how these objects are really very close to the original ideas of objects in a few moments. But um, these are objects that exchange messages. Now, a lot, a lot of times we think in terms of, well, I'm using OO, I invoke methods on an object, right? That's not exactly how OO was meant to be used, and I'll explain that to you. But for right now, let's just think about DDD as being this bounded context and the ubiquitous language that is modeled, let's say, as objects. So inside this, each of these yellow circles represents a, a concept that is important to the business and uh, and has a, a specific set of behavior and data that it um, that it hosts and uses. Um, just a comment, you know, I think a lot of us these days, a lot of software developers um, sort of operate by the fear of missing out. What do I mean by that? Well, a lot of times our, our software tools that are available out there, they become so hyped and popular that, that uh, we feel like if we aren't using them, 
you know, like, what, a, what am I going to do if I can't put that technology on my resume? You know, I'll be lost forever. You know, I have to tell you that um, back in, like, the mid to late 1980s, if you didn't have EJB on your resume, you were done for. How's that going today? You know? So, you know, but now this is what I call the fear of missing out 1.0. So you're not using the technologies that you wish you were using. So you solve that problem with fear of missing out 1.1. Right? This is what you get. So your core domain, of course, is, is quite insignificant because you can solve every problem with Kubernetes and Kafka. Right? And uh, notice that the core domain is downstream and these cool, awesome tools that everybody needs to use and, and overuse, right? Um, they're upstream because they have control of everything. They're, they're, you're, you're completely subject and dependent on those and all your problems get solved there. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying at all that Kubernetes and Kafka are not good tools. They're, they're great tools. That's been proven already. But what about the business? What about the business? This, if we aren't solving problems for the business, we can put anything we want to on our resumes. Um, the software that we develop is worthless if we are focused on this instead of on what the business needs. <coughs> um, think of domain-driven design as a learning tool. Um, it is uh, very much about learning because People within the business have ideas in their head, in their brain, that they don't even know how to describe very well, but the ideas are there. How many here can, can hear a song in their brain, like clearly, like, you know, do you have a song stuck in your head from the day, from today, or maybe even days ago, anyone here, and you hear the, the are you serious? I have music playing through my head constantly. Is that weird? I don't know. <laughs> but you know what's really interesting about that? Is I can hear the music perfectly playing through my head, and then I try to hum it to describe it. Now, what is this song called? Kind of what's the title of this song? Because I want to listen to it for real, you know? And I try to hum it or sing it or something, and it just, it's a disaster, right? This is what happens with software modeling. Because people have ideas in their head and they don't know how to describe it. And in an attempt to describe it, they can actually describe it incorrectly. So we have to, as software developers, draw out that knowledge, the ideas, the vision, the concepts. Draw it out, capture it, draw out more, ask questions converse, collaborate. And the really hard problems are not the obvious problems. The hard problems that need to be solved are the corner cases, the things that you know we sort of never see coming. We, we're asked to estimate how long will it take to develop this system, and we say, oh, that's easy, right? And then how many different use cases hit you that you never anticipated. You know exactly what I'm saying. And by the time you realize that you are not prepared for that level of complexity with the software architecture and design that you're using, it's too late. You already have, you know, many weeks or, or, or months sunk into this um, effort. There's no way management's going to let you rewind. And so what do you do from here out? You suffer. Right? And then you just keep building and building and building on a bad foundation, on, on incorrect assumptions, and you try to patch here and there, and before you know it, you've got a big ball of money. DDD is about learning. Learn with DDD. Learn what belongs in this bounded context, and why something belongs in this bounded context and not in another bounded context. So this is what I like to say, knowledge or learning begets knowledge and knowledge changes everything. Uh, 
I think this is true in life in general, and it's true in software development. The more we learn, we, we as a team, when we're working together, are changed by the knowledge that we gain. The software that we produce is changed from iffy, possibly <coughs> shippable, to understandable, right? <coughs> to deployable, to changeable, to, to maintainable, where we can uh, iterate quickly and pr produce incremental value and deploy. And we do that over and over and over again, and that is pretty much what we should be doing. But every single step of the way we are learning, we are not just writing code because we want to just sit at our desk and code all day long. We code because we understand, we learn. And you can be right in the middle of coding and hit a roadblock in your mind. We didn't plan for this. We didn't discuss it. I don't know what's going on. You gonna, are you going to sit there and make something up now? Or are you going to get up from your seat and go talk to the business? Learning. Knowledge changes everything. So, um, I'm going to talk about reactive DDD. So reactive is primarily um, embodied by mes message-driven components. So the components in a software model in a bounded context that are primarily message-driven tend to be reactive because the, the receipt of a message causes the component that receives the message to react to it just in time. Okay? Because they are message driven, it's possible for them to be responsive. So while a lot of software blocks, where a lot of software uh, is waiting on I.O. Or, or waiting on some sort of um, you know, request to, to respond, blocking it at the sort of you know, HTTP level, or the database level, or the file level, and a lot, and the network level, a lot of different ways that you can block. So we purposely designed the software to be message driven and decoupled from time so that it can be responsive instead of blocking. Resilient. This is where our um, where you know uh, software can crash. Right? Software can crash. We're resilient if that software is not just encapsulating data, encapsulating behavior, but isolating the rest of the system from failure. And reactive supports this. It supports it because it's message driven. An exception is thrown, that exception is turned into a message and delivered to the component that is responsible for supervising the crash component. When, when, when some software throws an exception in your world, what do you do about that? You hope hope that, that it's an unchecked exception, right? And you just let it go all the way to the top. Because what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do to correct software that threw an exception that's five layers below you? Nothing. You don't know how to respond to that. Instead, allow a supervisor component that knows how to deal with resiliency for that specific crash um, element of our model or, or whatever it happens to be and the resiliency is then maintained. Elastic means that our software can grow uh, out or scale out as needed and scale back in as, um, as necessary when we don't have as much uh, demand on the system so it's sometimes of the day we have high demand, other times we have lower demand, 
and the software can literally grow and shrink as as necessary. And then, you know, with these re reactive concepts and and characteristics and properties of software, the DDD part is business driven. So we're combining technology with business and we want the software to be not only reactive but driven by the needs of the business. So what I uh, work with um, these days mostly and, and actually for the past several years, maybe, I don't know, seven or eight years, something like that, um, is the actor model. This is primarily what I, uh, um, you know, want to develop in and primarily what I attempt to develop in and actually what I develop for with the Blingo platform. And I, and I just want to point out that this man, Alan Kay, this is Dr. Alan Kay, who has been, you know, was developing software um, in the 1960s. Probably most of us weren't born, maybe even for decades after that time, so, you know, and, and the ones who were born at that time were probably, probably pretty young. Um, I'm not telling you if I could remember when the year that um, Alan Kay started developing software, but maybe I could. And um, Alan Kay was really disappointed in the way that objects turned out because he invented object oriented. It was his. You know, go back and, and view um, talks of his, read his papers. He invented object oriented. Shortly after that time, in the year 1973, Dr. Carl Hewitt and his colleagues um, invented the actor model. It was based on objects and it was based on message passing, just like Alan Kay intended for objects, but the objects in the actor model were asynchronous messaging. And so reactive actually came about clear back in the late 60s to early 70s. So you look at reactive and you the word and you think it's a buzzword, it's like, ooh, yeah, they're always inventing something new. Reactive has been around for a long time. Okay? And it's probably the fault of the industry that these, that these concepts have not been carried forward uh, more thoroughly. Now, Alan Kay is known to have said, I can tell you that when I was thinking about the definition, what is object-oriented to me, he said, I will guarantee you I did not have C++ in mind. So the method invocation, um, it just doesn't cut it. Alan Kay said that looking back and to what he meant about object-oriented and bringing that up to the future, he said that the actor model retained more of what I thought were the good features of the object idea. Message passing, isolation, and late binding. Okay. So, we're used to developing with objects that block. The client object, this is not a server, this is not a remote process, this is an object. Client and an object that is the server. They're in the same VM or, or process, okay? And the client wants the server to do something, it invokes a method, and the client blocks until the server completes, and what we're not seeing is how many dependencies are there behind the server that will have to run before the client gets control again. This is blocking software. So looking back at the year 1973 when the actor model was conceived uh, by Dr. Hewitt and, and his colleagues, you know, this is the world that they lived in. Um, Amazing, isn't it? Less than uh, um, one megahertz of, of clock speed. 
maybe about 700. What would that be? I don't even know how to say it. What is that? Uh, uh, Trying to think of the mil, mil, millihertz. Kilo, kilo, kilo. Oh, kilohertz. Oh, kilohertz. Okay, there you go. Yeah. Wow, it's been so long, I forgot. So, so less than a megahertz of, of clock speed. Transistors down around maybe you know 1500. Is that right? Something like that. Um, and you know, just amazing that Carl Hewitt saw this coming. Um, way back, and the reason he didn't quit is because he said, I know that there will be multiple processors and computers and fast networks someday, and that's why I know this is going to work. Pretty amazing, isn't it? So this is what we have today. We have these kinds of super multi-core processors, the Intel Xeon, I think this has something like 56 cores in it, so you can run 112 threads simultaneously. But even, even like this, whatever, four-year-old MacBook Pro, I can run, you know, what is it? Well, I think I can run uh, eight threads simultaneously on this. Many servers don't have that. Spin up a, an AWS um, node, right? Do you have even eight threads alive on, on that node at any given time? Maybe you'll pay for it. So this is what we have. We have fast processors, but not as fast as they were uh, being developed through the era of Moore's Law being, being held true that every two years or less, we would see a doubling in clock speed and more transistors. So about the year 2003, notice right what happened is, you know, 30 years after Carl Hewitt saw this vision of fast networks and a lot of cores, the speed, the clock speed of processors started to fall off to the point where in the past several years to see a doubling in clock speed requires about nine years. Requires about nine years. So we need these, we need more cores doing more simultaneously than blocking and waiting for single operations to process. And now, you know, of course you say, okay, I'll just write my own threading. Best wishes, it's really hard. And even when you think you got it all right, I mean, I've had people say, yeah, I've done it all right. I don't know, I guess, I'm not saying it's not possible. But it is really, really hard to get right. And I, you, do you know what I'm talking about? You've, you've done it. What are some of the problems you run into with? Have, well, have you run into the problem where, um, say, you have? Let, describe it this way. You have a countdown latch. You know what a countdown latch is, right? It's a, it's an atomic um, variable that counts down, and when it reaches zero, the thread that's blocking for that. Um, countdown to reach zero will unblock and it will start running. And so you have a test that says, I'm going to, after the countdown latch, I'm going to assert that a value is what I expect it to be. But then the code under test does this. It has code that says, change value, change value, change value, and you're reading the code and you're looking at it and you're saying, okay, I see all those values change. And then we clear the countdown latch. And when the other thread running, running the test sees that, guess what? The variables aren't changed yet. And you're just going, no, way on. No, that's impossible. No, it's absolutely possible because of the design of modern processors because they are optimizing, they see that there's no conditional in the code or whatever their algorithm is, and they say, oh, I can go ahead and execute this line of code that clears the countdown latch before these lines of code because I know it's always going to be done. And then the thread over here sees the countdown latch cleared and your test fails. And you can stare at that code for a long time and insist that there is absolutely no way in the world that this could possibly be happening. And 
go, go prove it to yourself. The only way to prevent that is to actually make the two threads synchronize. The, I mean, you can, you can set a timer, wait for, you know, it's hard, trust me, it's hard, right? And then, that's not even talking about just things like, okay, I think it's easy, you know, this thread is reading something out of a, a work queue, this thread is trying to end queue, but it's blocked because this thread is currently has the, the queue blocked, and, you know, you think, oh, these two threads over here, they're wide open, they've got stuff to do, but they're both blocking on a synchronized entity access because if they didn't synchronize between the two, they would corrupt the data in the thread. And so you know what you have? You've got this really, really complex single-threaded system. That's what happens. So, um, the actor model, the big idea is messaging. Uh, what Alan Kay said about the actor model is that a sender will send a message to a receiver. So this is the idea of objects. This is an object. This is an object. The difference between this object and the or these objects and the blocking objects are that um, this actor has a mailbox. This actor has a mailbox, and when this message is sent from this actor to this actor, it will be enqueued in the mailbox. This actor, the sender, will continue operation on the thread that's been allocated for it or been, been given for it to run on. So it's completely asynchronous. And now you're thinking, well, but if this actor receives multiple messages at a time, won't I have to protect the inside data, the data that's held by the receiver? No, because it's guaranteed that this actor will process only one message at a time. So in effect, the actor is single-threaded. It is single-threaded and therefore can be designed single-threaded without volatile data, but we're also guaranteed that, that other actors are processing messages on other threads simultaneously. So that altogether, the throughput of the system and the, and the scalability of the system can be much higher than blocking designs or, or, or blocking languages and, and paradigms. So, and Alan Kay said, yes, messaging is the big idea of objects. Okay. So that's where we've been and where we are now. So actors are reactive, as I said, and the actor model, um, you know, has a lot of potential for use because all of these computing resources are cheap. They're very cheap. You know, cores are relatively cheap. Memory is cheap. The cloud is cheap. IoT devices are cheap. Storage is cheap. The network is cheap, right? So there's a lot of compelling reason to try to use all cores and all resources simultaneously if, if you possibly can. So like I was saying, this uh, Xeon, um, processor has 56 cores, but with hyper-threading, it means that each core can run two threads, so 112 threads simultaneously. You know, um, you can find, you know, probably faster chips um, or, or even more cores, but that's fast, that things are going to be cranking through this processor simultaneously very, very quickly. So, a lot of benefit to gain from this. Now, I like to suggest that because the network is late, because the network is, you know, not fail safe, the network has partitions. Anything that can happen on the network will happen. Any failure that can happen on the network, any latency that can happen will happen. 
So design your software so that it doesn't care about that. You're not going to fail on a REST request and response because you get a network partition. Messaging, asynchronous messaging, is the way to build latency and embrace latency in your software design because you do not depend on time and a certain response to tell you that you can now do something else. Instead, you use a thread to send a message to another actor, whether it's over the network or not, and eventually you'll get a reply from that actor, or you'll find out that it didn't reply in a, soon enough, and so you send another message. And eventually, that network partition will heal, or the database will return to operation, or, 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 right? Just go down the line, anything that could possibly fail will, but when you build latency and, and the expectation that you will not have an immediate result, you will have better software designs if you're designing for distributed computing. So this is a matter of doing more with less because you're using all the machine resources that are available um, very efficiently. So the actor model is about direct asynchronous messaging. A lot of us are probably familiar with uh, um, Publish, subscribe, this is where you just, a, a publisher throws a message onto a topic or an exchange or whatever it happens to be. And uh, the, the subscribers, one or many, will just receive that message, right? But this is different with the actor model. It is not publish, subscribe, although it can support publish, subscribe. The main uh, pattern of, of actors is direct asynchronous messaging. So because the sender knows the address of the receiver, it can send a message to that address, and that address that message is delivered to the address at the um, at the receiver's mailbox. Um, block free, share nothing. So notice, we see three senders sending this receiver messages simultaneously. Do we have to start synchronizing, blocking around data? No, we don't, because notice that any one of these messages arrives as message one, another one is next, message two, message three, and this mailbox is non-blocking. So it doesn't block, and yet, uh, because of, of the atomic um, operations that are available on the processor, we can guarantee that these messages will not overwrite or corrupt one another. And then they will be processed in the order in which they were actually received. Um, actors know how to become another kind of protocol. So as, it's res as this actor is responding to this message, it prepares itself to receive the ne next message by saying, I want to now look like a different kind of protocol. And therefore, when this sender, uh, sender's message arrives in the next sequence, it will be handled by a different protocol, even though it is the exact same actor instance or object instance. And then actors have um, the uh, hierarchical um, supervision. And um, actor concurrency is demonstrated here. Notice that we have a sequence of operations, but do you see any you see any errors in this diagram? Is it wow, should those two twos be there and the two threes? That must be a problem, right? No, it's actually not. Because here's what happens. A client, as sequence one, sends a command message to a router. This router will forward this message to some sort of receiver. But before it does that, it sets a scheduled timer for some time in the future, which is the timer is running asynchronously. So this is the actual second sequence. The third sequence is to then, um, hold on a second. The third sequence, or the second sequence also simultaneously, as this 
uh, timeout timer is being set simultaneously this um, to sequence delivers this message to the receiver's mailbox. And now there's the opportunity for a race condition. And as soon as you hear race, you're thinking bad. But this is actually an okay race because it's a race between the timer completing first or the receiver replying with a success message to the router first. Which one will happen first? We don't know. Will data be corrupted if they both occur simultaneously? No, as, you, as I've already said, this actor's mailbox will be in queue with either this message or this message first. The other one will be second. And so it could be that this timer is nowhere near timing out and this uh, succeeds very quickly, in, in which case the router simply cancels the timer. Okay? And then it, it replies here to the client with success. But if the timeout um, fires and we get a, a signal from the timeout, then we're going to reply with a timeout. And then when this success um, or this message is seen, it's actually ignored or some sort of uh, delivery error is logged. So how many actors can be in an actor world such as Blinko's? 50, 100, a million? It's actually uh, could be several million actors active at any given time, but there are also parts of the or design in the uh, actor world that um, manages memory overhead and swaps actors in and out of memory as needed. So you actually um, don't lose much or, or take a, a very big hit. Think of actually, you know, like, like uh, um, processes are swapped or portions of pop processes are swapped by the operating system in and out of memory to disk. Um, the, the same kind of thing happens with the actor's world design. So when you think about the complexity in modern architectures today and software, this is a pretty typical, just you know, sort of like three-layer architecture. It, this is actually um, represented by, or represents the ports and adapters architecture. So imagine one ring being around this outside and this outside, and then you have an inside ring with the application, and then a, and then a ring inside that, or a circle inside that for the domain model. But look at all these components and and the layers that you have to manage to understand how to deliver software today using you know a typical um, framework or, or toolkit or whatever it happens to be. But then consider what you get with the actor model. Um, two layers. Why is that? Well, this is actually representative of a REST endpoint, let's say, or it could be a message and a message listener endpoint. So we have a controller or a REST endpoint, and that controller gets a request, let's say, a REST request, HTTP request, and it uh, takes the parameters from that request and sends a command message to an actor entity known as a book. And the book then uh, honors the order book command and emits the book ordered event. This is pretty much all that you face when you're using the actor model with domain-driven design because the other layers are just managed for you very, very simply. There are, there are default, for example, the default um, persistence capabilities built into Flingo, um, and uh, we support four different kinds of persistence. Anything from, from OR mapping to um, event sourcing to CQRS, uh, uh, you know, blob storage to uh, read and write models to uh, simple JDBC and Java, and, and similar is becoming available soon with um, with uh, the .NET side of things too. So consider 
actors, objects done right. This is simply um, the way that actors or that objects were supposed to work from the start. Now, reactive DDD is not only about a single bounded context, but actually using the bounded context concept um, broadly and also modeling the individual components inside with the ubiquitous language. And these can be modeled as actors. And then any communication across these components is also message driven. And therefore, you have an entire reactive system, a system that is designed from the start to be reactive and is reactive through and through. Strategic design with DDD, this is where we decide uh, what are the relationships between various bounded contexts. This is called context mapping. So the important thing about a context map is not just the uh, bounded context within it, but the relationships and integration styles that are used on the line. And this helps us solve uh, big problems with overall system strategy. Tactical patterns are more about the actors, the commands that they receive, the events that they emit, and, and so forth. Uh, information exchange, this is where messages are, uh, for example, a command message is sent asynchronously from this bounded context to this bounded context. The bounded context reacts to that command, so it's reactive. It reacts to that command by uh, dispatching the command to something inside the domain model. And the domain model handles that. And it may then, in turn, respond with an event. This event is also asynchronously de delivered. The bounded context is um, um, the bounded context will receive this asynchronously and it will uh, consume internally asynchronously with these actors. Or we may have uh, executed a query of some kind against this bounded context and the, the uh, response that we get is a document message that is also delivered asynchronously and this bounded context will react to it. So this is how reactive information exchange can work. And of course, when we start exchan exchanging messages between bounded contexts, wouldn't it be a good idea to know how these messages are actually exchanged and which ones, which types are exchanged? This is where a schema registry comes in quite importantly because um, the schema registry gives us a location to publish a language that we're willing to exchange with other bounded contexts. In fact, DDD calls it a published language. So each bounded context can have a published language, and the published language is comprised of commands, events, documents, and even other kinds of data objects. Okay? And this is a part of Lingo that um, I think is, is an extremely part, important part of Lingo. Um, so reactive DDD is per pervasive throughout the system. That is actually um, part of the solution. In, this also supports emerging architecture. This uh, Using this E word can get you into trouble depending on the architect that you're speaking to. But, but actually, I think that lean architecture, agile architecture, and agile design are all about emerging. If, if you try to create architecture uh, completely up front, you'll get several things wrong. You'll be missing uh, um, components from your architecture. You will, you will also have, no, no doubt, too many components uh, or component types or, or uh, architecture patterns that you won't need. And so simply allow the, the architecture to speak to you and tell you what it needs. So this is what I referred to earlier as the ports and adapters architecture. And then um, you, know, you can imagine a system being created with the same kinds of individual service architectures to create an entire system. And then the messages or um, any kind of information exchange is happening through interfaces between the various um, or, uh, bounded contexts of the system. 
So now, in a reactive DDD um, design boundary, inside a bounded context, notice that your REST endpoints, resource handlers, are actors. They are reactive. They're running on a thread, and when this resource handler or uh, REST endpoint receives a request, it is receiving it asynchronously, and when it dispatches that request as a behavior on the domain model, that is dispatched asynchronously, and guess what? There's now no thread being used by this. The thread has been given up until this finishes, and then once a response is provided, or needs to be provided, this resource uh, or REST endpoint will receive um, the use of a thread again, and the response can be provided. So there's no need for blocking. And even uh, if this bounded context were to be dependent on REST uh, endpoints in another bounded context, even the client, the Blingo client, uh, does not block. So there's, there's no blocking uh, pretty much in any of the Blingo components other than those that, that um, you know, integrate with database drivers that are not asynchronous. And yet, we still have strategies, um, what I call smart blocking, to prevent um, actual blocking of application or, or service threads. So modeling uncertainty becomes a thing. Uh, my guidance for, for modeling um, or for dealing with the uncertainty that happens with distributed computing is to push the decisions that may be um, uh, driven by uh, latency of messages, of order messages, any of these kinds of concerns. Push those into the domain model and model them as part of the business. I have um, a video on my on my YouTube account um, that that covers this topic rather thoroughly. I, I suggest that you read that. Um, one of the one of the concepts that can be used here is when um, what about the uncertainty of the network? If the network is disconnected, what happens to this machine? Uh, and this, by the way, is in a healthcare um, domain. What if this machine that's being used to treat a patient that's you know potentially uh, critically ill or 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 quite ill. What if there's a disconnect between this machine that's out at a clinic or some sort of um, uh, medical facility and the central you know sort of or or regional um, servers and so forth that that actually run the clinical treatments uh, operations on the server side. Well, it, it appears that uh, one thing that we have to deal with is that this event will arrive first, but these two events are being held up. What's going to happen when the network heals? Well, we simply, I thought I had the next slide there for that. What will happen is we're simply caching this data, these events in our on our machine side, because we have intelligent uh, software and hardware available here, and then when this network heals, these will continue to be processed. It could be that they're delivered out of order, but all of those sort of uncertainties about um, out of order delivery or latent delivery or duplicate delivery can all be handled within the domain model by by ensuring that you're modeling. Um, the, uh, the iffy sort of situations as close to the business decisions as possible. Here's another one, how do we deal with duplicates? We simply set a state on a, on a domain model entity that says, I've already seen that. Do you know how much more difficult it is that out, out of the edge of the, the architecture um, to try to deduplicate and then Actually, the deduplication part is pretty easy, really easy. It's just how much look-aside data do we keep and for how long do we keep it, you know? What happens if we decide to, to delete the, the, the um, record of, I have already seen this message before, I won't process it again? 
Um, what if we delete that and then the next minute or hour or day, um, the same messages are unleashed again. Those messages will get through. But that will never happen if you simply keep a status in your domain model that says, I've already seen this, right? So that can be managed quite effectively. Uh, I hate to use the word easy, but compared to the other uh, alternative, quite easy indeed, right? So when we keep this look aside, notice what can happen, right? What will happen if all of these, uh, these events are coming in, they're translated to commands, they hit this entity, if, if both of, if this duplicate message gets through, we'll end up publishing multiple events. But that would actually be incorrect. That would be, um, you know, an incorrect response. So instead, by keeping this state, when we see the same command message enter the, the event a second time, or a third time, or a fourth time, we simply ignore it. And that way, only a single event is emitted from that entity. Um, you know, other strategies for, you know, for example, what what number of events might um, happen. For for example, um, non-commutative. This is where. So this was a, a commutative operation. This means that it's a non-destructive. You know, non. You know, a sort of an error-free condition. So the state simply serves as we can safely ignore or reapply that as necessary. But the non-commutative means that we definitely need to know have we seen this before so that we absolutely do not repeat it, such as um, a bank account transaction on a debit or a credit that yet should only be applied once. Um, out of sequence, so instead of, um, instead of bringing in so notice that, that this event to is translated to a command to, and three steps have to be completed. But notice, um, where are the other, where is message one that, should, that we should have, been seen, should have seen first, and where is message three? We simply let those pass through, and step two is completed, at some future point, step one will be completed, and at some future point, step three will be completed. And these could be completely out of order. And yet, once all three of these are seen by the entity, we will then call this done. So the resequencing is completely unnecessary. We just let them uh, arrive when they arrive. So this is the, the effect, right? So two actually ends up being very late. One is out of order. Three happens first, right? So we, we set three and we set one. Where is two? It doesn't happen for some time. It finally happens. Now we emit the, the proper event from the entity. So reactive is not blocking and not sharing. And this is where I talk about, uh, for example, if I have to perform IO and I have a thread pool, what happens to a thread that needs to do I.O., it's going to block, right? And it may block very briefly, or it may block um, for some time frame. What can you do about that? S smart blocking says allocate multiple pools. Allocate a pool only for the I.O., and allocate a separate pool that's only used for the application. And this can be a very limited size pool because actually <coughs> Um, with actors, you probably need no more than one writer um, on, the, on the side of the actor because actually single writer is much more efficient because um, the, the, process, the uh, database is not contending, this is not contending for connections, this is not contending for uh, locks and so forth, and so a single writer can be much faster than um, multi-writers. Sharing. What if we have many resources, actors, that are trying to share reusable buffers from this uh, buffer pool? Um, smart sharing says grow the buffer pool, make it elastic, hand out as many um, buffers as are needed. You can even pre-allocate them in, in certain you know, 
chunks, such as maybe five or ten or so at a time. And then, as the demand uh, reduces on the server, then you can shrink this, this pool so it's actually um, elastic. Okay, so let's talk about some use cases. Here's um, a really, I think, a nice use case to talk about or set of use cases because it involves healthcare. Um, healthcare actually helps people, right? So you're not only, you know, making a living and, and uh, we're, we're not just making, you know, companies and, and their, you know, investors and so forth mega rich, but we're actually really helping people. So this is one of my favorite topics. Maybe another one is helping disadvantaged families and there's software like that out there that, that needs to be written and some of the solutions aren't really very good at all. Um, so, what are we going to learn about healthcare? There's learning to do here. There's a lot of learning around clinical data. <coughs> what data do we collect from treatments on patients that could be useful? Patient behavior and sentiment data. Modeling the patient as we would model the clinical data allows us to track, does the patient take their medication? Does the patient show for their treatments? Does the patient like it or not? Do they behave poorly? Is there something that we can do to alter poor behavior and create better behavior among the patients? Then pharmaceutical data. How do we model that so that the analytics behind the pharmaceutical data mixed with the clinical data and research data can help us to provide better um, treatment solutions and, and help uh, people who have illnesses to, to recover from them. Well, clinical data, patient behavior, and, and sentiment, these can be modeled using the IoT concept of, and, and when I say IoT, the Internet of Things, but maybe we like to think of it as the Internet of Toys, right? Because, you know, we get to play with lots of cool devices. Um, so digital twins, this is where we will model clinical concepts and patient concepts to actually look and behave and act like the physical thing. Okay? So for example, I mean even if you have a monitor that's monitoring you know, water levels or, or fuel levels or something in, in these big tanks or something like that, you know, th this IoT device is sending data about what it sees and so we can actually model a water, a tank of water or a tank of fuel or whatever just as it is. And so we can do the same thing uh, with clinical data and patient behavior and sentiment. We can also create digital twins that um, represent the very kind of machine, treatment machine, that's being um, used um, to treat the patient. So, and these are generally collecting clinical data and sending the clinical data back to uh, the clinic operations or, or the central or regional um, services. Patient behavior and sentiment. Here you see uh, a man who is, uh, you know, setting himself up for getting a dialysis treatment and it's home, right? Notice there's a little bedpost here in the background, so he's actually has a dialysis machine in his home, a smaller machine than you might see, um, you know, really at, at one of the actual physical clinics. And look, the sentiment is good. He's performing these um, uh, operations, actually, that a clinic, you know, a technician or, or a nurse or a doctor might perform. He's doing that himself. So this is a good patient behavior and sentiment. And so we can model that. We can show that this patient has, you know, good behaviors, proper behaviors to the treatment. What is that going to show? It's going to show the trends that this patient is benefited where other patients who have less uh, uh, exemplary behavior may not be ben benefiting. We can show trends. We can, we can um, uh, create a lot of knowledge around this. So, in our agile design, we can uh, design the clinical treatments with a patient digital twin. 
or of many patient digital twins, right? One for each patient. The clinician, the actual person that is helping in the clinic, such as a nurse or a technician. The doctor, we can model the doctor, what they do, the prescriptions that they write. The machine that's performing the, uh, the treatment and the criteria for, for uh, actually setting up the machine for operation. On the diagnosis side, we can also have a different model of a patient. Notice that this is clinical treatments. A patient in this valid context is different than a patient in this valid context. And we have pharmaceutical data and research that can be used to show, for example, what are the results of the patient's uh, behavior and sentiment and how that plays in with the pharmaceutical medical uh, or the, the medications that are taken by the patient and, and their reaction to them and any research about that, all with the intent of making uh, the patient's life a, a better experience even though they have some sort of disease or, or other illness. So domain-driven design emphasizes fluency in the bounded context. We want to be explicit about the operations and the concepts in our model. How do we actually design fluent behaviors? This is an example of uh, the Blingo, part of the Blingo API. You've probably all heard of futures, right? Um, well, this is sort of like a future. Uh, and, and if you're into, you know, um, functional programming, you'll, you may get really excited to hear that this is very much like a, like a, um, like a monad, right? Big, big scary word. But actually what's really happening here is this is the way that we create pipelines of asynchronous operations and after one of the steps in the pipeline finishes, we then handle that on a separate thread and and then we have expressiveness as in and then, and then to, and then consume with, and, and all of these operations are made to, um, to provide a very simple interface for what can be a very complex problem to solve. And that is basically, how do I perform operations completely asynchronously and also create sequence, you know, Within these, so that the so that the operations are um, are not causing problems uh, with with the other operations. So, in modeling a machine, um, machine gather patient vitals. Notice how that reads very fluently. Um, it's just like the kind of conversation that we would have in a meeting with with uh, our developers and domain experts together. Treatment record vitals read. You know, so, so another fluent operation. This is all possible because of the way that Blingo is designed. You may have heard of other kinds of uh, actor frameworks or toolkits or whatever they happen to be, but they do not support this level of fluency or even you know, beyond this uh, level of fluency, which I'm not showing you here, there are other many examples I can give you where it's not just the name of the object and the name of the behavior or the, the message that's going to be sent, but it actually also includes the parameter names. And so you could read machine gather patient vitals, treatment record vitals read. This reads very fluently. It's just like our team discusses our mental model. Here's another example. Vitals. The vitals that are being read from, that are being seen or gathered from a machine, notice how this is handled using reactive uh, streams. We have a subscriber, a subscriber to reading, to a reading, a reading from the machine. And on next, so whenever the reading is available, we receive the reading, and what do we do? We create an event, vitals read, from the reading. Notice how that reads nice and fluently. We know exactly what's happening. No setters and getters in this. 
and it's not a good design. Treatment record event. So um, I think I would have named this better than event, except I was out of slide real estate here. So pardon me for the for the sort of poorly named event. It could be much better, but just no no room on the slide. Now notice, does this on next kind of corrupt our ubiquitous language? No, it's simply an internal implementation of a subscriber, what is on the surface to the client of, of this vitals is the fact that it is at vitals. Internally, the implementa implementation can be uh, you know, used to, to tuck away or hide the, the details of this implementation. Okay, and then other fluency is available. Um, Lingo uh, is currently, I think we are at currently at 0.8.3. It's being used in production. Um, I feel that there are a few more components that need to be uh, completed before we can push it out as officially production released, but it is being used in production. Um, uh, some components to take a look at, Lingo Schemata, which is the schema registry. This uses semantic versioning to, um, to distinguish between um, non-breaking changes and breaking changes. So for example, anything that, that shares any uh, version of this domain event in the schema registry that shares the same major version must be forward and backward compatible, whereas the 2.0 says that this can be a breaking change. And notice you also have, well, it's not in here, but you have the ability to, to be both in a draft mode for any of these schema definitions or a published mode. A draft mode means that clients can start using it, start consuming the events, for, for example, but because it's in draft mode, I have uh, the right to make changes to this schema if, if we find out that we need to, and you will have to change until we're golden and we go into publish mode for that, for that uh, published schema. So this is your way to, to have a DDD published language um, in your for your bounded context that's safe to consume. This is the, the overall sort of lingo architecture in that um, the, a, an actor world is where actors live. They actually play on stages. You can have multiple stages within a single uh, actor world. And um, for example, you may want your system level actors to, um, to, to play in one, on one stage, on the default stage but you want your service-based actors to play in a different one. Lingo actors is the sort of bedrock uh, foundational components that were component. Um, Lingo HTTP is a fully reactive actor-based HTTP server. Um, and uh, Lingo Lattice is um, the, the means to have multiple um, nodes in a cluster that are able to send messages to, to actors across the, the cluster um, nodes and, um, and also, also contains the, the um, components for uh, event sourcing, for um, object mapping, for um, CQRS state, uh, blob state, and, and things like that, and even process managers, sagas, and, and so forth, all of those components are in the last um, major component, Lingo Streams, um, and now uh, we have some, some code to show. Alish, did, are you still around? What is that? I'll tell you what, um, I'm going to have a sip of beer. <laughs> I saw. Yeah, Yeah, so I don't know what you, 
you have something in mind? Did you want to use your machine to, to demo something? No? What, what, what did you want to talk about? Or just say something else there. I'll prepare a demo. You did? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And Brian? Brian? Oh, yeah, okay. Um, okay. Let me uh, yeah, so let me show you some. I'll show you some code um, with enough fear. We can get through this. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Now, one thing that you're going to notice right away is that I see all these clips. It's your uh, grandfather's. Idea. Um, okay. So, oh, you can't see it. Okay, so um, just as sort of an overview of uh, the, the major components, Blingo actors, Blingo auth, cluster, directory, HTTP, lattice. Uh, there's a lattice exchange for RabbitMQ, for example, and you know there, there are other um, uh, integrations for, for other messaging on the way. Um, schemata, this is the schema registry. Uh, Symbio is the is the various um, kinds of, of uh, persistence that we have. So we have Symbio for uh, DynamoDB. This was written by by uh, Kevin Masteris, and actually a lot of the work on Lingo HTTP was uh, Alish's uh, contribution. Um, and the, the fluent um, configuration of of endpoints basically. Um, resources and uh, so we have foundation DB support we have geode support which is uh, basically the open source gemfire part of uh, gemfire so you can use an in-memory grid that scales for persistence we have JDBC which includes um, JDBI support and also uh, JPA support and hibernate support so you can do our mapping completely reactive Right, asynchronous through actors. Um, so just take some of the components that you've been familiar with for a long time and just think of those being uh, Im implemented using actors in a completely you know, reactive and asynchronous way. So that's that. And then, um, so that's just a little overview of the project. And now I'm going to load. Um, so the, the example that Kevin and I uh, showed today was, um, actually we didn't have time to show the whole thing, but it's, um, actually if you bring up a browser, I'll, uh, oh, this one, okay. So the one that Kevin and I were, are uh, presented today, and Kevin actually wrote this um, example. So Blingo is running on Android. So you can run Blingo, the whole platform, on an Android device. And that Android device can talk whatever HTTP to a server that is running um, on you know a server, a real server, and uh, the the example that Kevin demonstrated is that we have a little uh, what's called a hike, a hike um, front end and a, and a hike back end, and this is something where you can take. Oh, don't let this happen. <laughs> Um, so what you can do is you take your phone, 
Uh, you load the hike application and you go hiking in the in the hills around Barcelona in the woods, you know, in the trees, wherever. And uh, people can know where you are on your hike. And if you get into any danger on your hike, you press a uh, an alarm button on the application running, and and any of the hikers in the area will then be alerted of your position and can come to assist you, help you, or, or something like that out of, out of some kind of danger. Maybe you ran out of water, dehydrated, sprained your ankle, something, you know, uh, um, unexpected happened and you need some help. So that's, and, and that is running both on the Android uh, phone device and also on uh, the server side. And there is an example, actually, so if I just do, how do I bring up the, um, This example is called Window Example IoT Android. You see Kevin's nice photo there. Um, what I wanted to do today at, at JBCN was I was going to have Kevin turn his back to the audience. I was going to run out and hide somewhere in the building and, and set the alarm. He had to find me to demonstrate it. We, we ran out of time for that. But you could do that right here at ThoughtWorks. You know, you could, uh, or, or you know, wherever you work. So you can build this application, run the server, uh, install the app on your Android device. Sorry, no, no Apple support right now. Um, but you know, you can always write your own front end uh, in Swift or whatever it happens to be. Um, yeah. So, so now if I want to go back to my IDE, for example. So I see a stop share. Let's say this. Okay, so there are several examples out there. They're all on the GitHub account. Um, and the sharing things, I got, I got to think of the order in which I want to say things now. But um, so um, there, there are you know several examples. I think Kevin's like maybe I don't have it here yet, but there's just a simple demonstration of actors called Actor Playground. This is two actors playing ping pong. Um, there's an e-commerce example that, that Brian wrote, still not completed, but you know, it shows you how an e-commerce interface might be written. Um, uh, an event journal, so seeing how event sourcing works at the very, very primitive level. And then um, here's actually the hype backend, but I think this is obsolete. The one that's out on GitHub right now is the more current one. And um, this is, uh, Front service and back service, these are used together to show the integration of. Um, Can you zoom it up there? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah.
Okay, so for, for example, let's look at this uh, user resource. This is a REST endpoint. Um, it's running on Blingo HTTP. And also notice, look, no, it doesn't need any special, um, you know, it doesn't extend any abstract base type or anything like that. Um, if you want to know about what world you're running in, that this uh, component is running in, that's backed by an actor, you get you get the world, you can get you know various pieces of, of the world, such as a stage that you're running in, or the, the default stage, and so forth. You can instantiate all these um, up front. Now, after the resource is instantiated, this is one of the main uh, features that, that Alish provided. And now notice that fluently you can register this user resource with um, uh, a post to slash users. The body of that request will be a JSON payload of type user data. And to handle this, will be the register method in the user resource class, okay, or the re user resource object. And then you can just look down the line, a patch, patch, so we can patch the user's contact information, we can patch the user's name, uh, we can get a user by ID and we can get all users that are registered. Um, Okay, so that's really cool, very, very convenient. There's also an equivalent way to do this if you prefer um, if you prefer configuration files, you can, you can accomplish the same thing. This is exactly the same that was uh, that you saw above. Um, so post to the register method. Um, patch and so forth. But I think you know another thing that's really pretty interesting here is notice that there are no annotations, right? no annotations um, inside this. You're you're dealing with an actor. You you get the user actor. Um, well, this is register. So notice how you're. Ubiquitous language is supported even at your um, REST endpoint. Change contact. Okay. Um, so register, change contact. Notice that after um, a specific user actor with this ID, user ID, already exists, then we ask the stage for the actor. And once we get that actor, we say, and then to. So that from here to here is asynchronous. And this operation, this and then, will not be performed until we get an asynchronous response from this asynchronous request of looking up the actor in, in the actor's directory on the stage. And then we will receive a user. Otherwise, if we receive no user, we respond with a not found. But if we receive the user, we're going to tell the user to change its contact data according to the parameters passed in. And then to completes with success of OK. And for example, you can see that you know, the rest of the response is, is provided OK with serialized user data. So we actually um, respond with the, the patched resource. Um, th this is actually, even this is going to be greatly simplified to the point where you, you, it, it is possible that you won't even need a REST resource endpoint, you can simply go in and implement your domain model um, and everything will, will be wired up from you, for you, but no annotations. Okay. 
So I thought it was kind of interesting today that um, somebody who has written, you know, some some web frameworks in, on the JVM um, and is currently working on another one was comparing their new framework to Spring um, to Spring. And in this comparison to Spring, the comments were made that. Um, Tests run in 25 milliseconds, you know? and this was in comparison, of course, to Spring, that where who knows how long it's going to take for a test to run. Some people don't even create tests because it takes them so long to run. Um, and then it was uh, and right and we only use 12 megabytes of memory versus gigabytes of memory that Spring uses, and then. You know, and all these and thens, and it, and it was stated as if it was a miracle. I mean, that's the way Lingo has worked all along. Is you know, you run your tests instantly; they just start instantly. We use very little memory. The whole platform is a couple megabytes in size. It'll grow a bit bigger than that. But but I just have to say, whenever you know your uh, your boot <coughs> component, your Spring Boot component, is like 25 times the size of the minimal Linux kernel and, and you know something that you can actually boot in two megabytes and spring boot is fifty megabytes and then uses gigabytes of memory when it when it actually does boot. You know, I think that toolkits or frameworks or whatever you want to call this, I, I don't care, just use it. But you're gonna you're gonna love this because it's so simple. This is the amount if you decide to write your own REST endpoints, here, this is as complex as it gets, okay? Um, you know, let's look at, at the actual user component. Um, so for example, there's this user, this is the protocol. So the protocol says that mainly after I get a new user, I can change its contact information and I can change its um, its name. And, and also notice that this may seem like, what's this with contact and with name? Um, when you're writing a, a fluent um, interface or, or protocol, now imagine that you have a user object, which you do have in in the user resource, right? And you say user with name, and you pass the name to it. User with contact, and you pass the contact to it. So you're writing fluently. When you want a new user, um, you, you use a, uh, a factory method to get that new user, and now, if you want to look at the actual user entity, so this user entity implements the user protocol. So the user entity is a DAD entity, let's say, or, or you know, just an entity. It doesn't necessarily have to be using DAD. It's instantiated with its initial state. It sets its initial state in its constructor. You don't have to use the constructor for that. You could use a message to, to initialize it as well. And then notice, for example, when we want to change the contact information of the user, we apply state with contact. So now we have a separate state object, which is an immutable object. Right? So this is an immutable type, a value type. That's our state. The only mutable concept in this entire entity is here. You can replace the state with a new state. So, you know, anybody that, that freaks out about mutability, when you can greatly reduce the mutability of anything, as in, I think it's pretty easy to look through your code and say, I can find the three places where this state is set. One of them is in the constructor. And notice, because this is not a sort of traditional programming model, instead of replacing, or instead of 
modifying the state right here. Instead, what we do is we apply the state with a new contact. And what we're going to do as an outcome of that is we're eventually going to provide a complete of the user state, which will be this state that we're providing in the lambda. And that state will be the state that is set, that is, that is available after this entire operation completes. What is this going to be when we apply? Notice the only two places where the state is actually mutated, or actually in this case, only one. So this state method takes the new state. I was actually thinking um, event sourcing, but in this case it's CQRS without event sourcing, and so the state itself is set in one place. So there are actually two places in this entire entity where anything is mutated. The constructor and this one place. And if you use this, this approach to persistence with Blingo, it's all, it's all asynchronous. It's entirely reactive. You have to know nothing about persistence at this level. And even if you're using the state store, the state store is already formulated. You simply start using it. That's it. There's no configuration other than just setting up your Postgres database or whatever database you want to use. So, um, you know, it's that simple. Let me show you some, some <coughs> event sourcing. If you know my Red Book examples, this is one of the bounded contexts, the IDD collaboration context. Um, and here you can see a forum. So a forum has these behaviors or protocol, and the forum entity looks like this. So it's, it's an event source entity that implements the protocol named forum. So again, its uh, new state is provided through its constructor. And when we call assign, uh, or actually send a message assign to the forum, we can assign a different moderator. So assign moderator. Notice that we're modeling the uncertainty here. What if somehow this request for modeling, for uh, assigning the moderator happened multiple times, but we had already done it? We don't want to apply or emit a new form moderator assigned event unless we're not already, uh, if that moderator has already is already the moderator that is currently set. So if that's not the case, then we do apply a new domain event for a moderator assigned with, very fluently read, with state of the tenant, state form ID, and so forth. And then we have several other um, command behaviors here. So commands being honored. And then finally, down here, notice how we actually transition the state. We have these simple methods, apply forum started, state equals new state, right? So we're, we're actually immutable, but replacing the state so that the state object itself is immutable. If we're um, applying a new forum moderator, assigned state with moderator, the new moderator, from, from the event type, um, state.closed, um, replacing this state, state with description, so the description from the domain event form described. It's just this simple. So, you know, in, in uh, you know, 125 or so lines of code, we have an event source aggregate that's, you know, you can write this Honestly, when you get when you get used to this programming uh, approach, you can write this aggregate in like probably 30 minutes or less. So, anyway, that gives you some idea of this. Um, if you want to see how the playground runs, just you know, if you want to jump in and just see how do how do these actor things work, this is a very simple test. All that it does is it starts the world using reasonable defaults and um, it creates a pinger actor and a ponger actor, and then it tells the pinger to ping to the ponger, and it starts, and basically 
what it's going to do is run, I think, for 10 times. Uh, so let's look in at the two actors. So there's the pinger protocol, which is ping to a ponger, right? That's the only operation in that protocol. And then there's a ponger, which uh, is a pong to a pinger, right? And here are the actors that, that actually implement those protocols. So the pinger pings, and it counts. So when it, when it receives a ping, it counts. And if the count is greater than or equal to 10, then it's going to stop itself, and it's going to stop the ponger. Otherwise, it's going to send the, uh, the pong message to the ponger, right? And the ponger is even simpler because it doesn't have to check for its own end. It just receives a pong, it logs the pong, and then it pings the pinger. Right? Okay. So let's watch this run. And notice too, there there's a chance that maybe um, do you know asynchronous programming enough to say that you cannot actually determine whether we'll see all the logging? Because the logger is actually an actor too. So the logger is running asynchronously and it, yeah, we have five minutes? Okay. okay. So we're going to run this test and here we go. Ah, look at that. We only saw five uh, pings and pongs, actually only Four. We only saw four pongs and five pings, but the test passed because it, um, oh, the test passed because there's no assertion. <laughs> okay, well, anyway, um, actually it really does work. Let me see, let me, let me run it again and see. Yeah, there we go, ten times. So it's just, it's just a matter of how many uh, um, logs you see before the world shuts down, right? Because the, the, the logger is on an actor itself, so it needs a thread to, to actually output the logs. And until it sees a thread, which may go, which the whole world may go away before it logs all of the, all of the output. And when that happens, the logger goes away too. So that's just the, the nature of, of the piece, which actually prevent that from happening. So anyway, I invite you to, to um, you know, look around. If, you, if you're interested in contributing to Blingo, we're, we're excited always to take, you know, to, to have new contributors. I only ask that you seriously, you know, if you really want to do it, please follow through because there is quite a bit of overhead in trying to bring a new, you know, person on. We're very happy to do it. We want to do that. But please just be serious about it because it, it I, you know, it's a lot of overhead. So, any questions for me? Yeah? Uh, how could you deal with time? For example, do you have any way to send schedule messages? Yes. Yeah, so um, in. Um, So in Lingo Common, I think this is what you're, what you're asking. There is there are some basic things here, like the completes that I showed you, which is the future type. And then there's a scheduler here. So the scheduler knows how to schedule repeated timer, repeated timer events and one-time timer events. And, um, and you receive those events by implementing the schedule. Um, and, and you get from the schedule, you get the schedule itself, the thing that was scheduled, and you get the data in a specific, you know, uh, generic type. That you Is that what you were talking about? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it's quite easy actually. So you just you just implement this interface on your actor, and you're yeah. Uh, 
How do you deploy it? What is the minimal unit of deployment? Can you deploy one actor or separately, or do you have to deploy the world? Well, everything, the whole world, everything that you need, basically, you need the actor's jar. So if but we go you actor, all at once. Yeah, you cannot update one actor at a time, or it's not in the. <laughs> Yeah, I was asking if you can update one actor at a time, or in, uh, in the idea is to deploy the whole pack. Oh, you mean like one actor type? Yeah. Yeah, I mean you could have one actor type in a in a jar file, and so if you're talking about like a microservice or something, yeah, yeah, you can right, do that. Fine, and I'll just like this yeah. yeah, yeah. So you can do that. Um, but how do you usually do it? Well, I would usually put an entire domain model into, you know, a, a jar file. The jar file would depend on, at a minimum, it would depend on Blingo Common and Blingo Actors, and that's pretty much the, the minimum that you need. Um, again, that just those two jar files alone are, are, you know, like probably 100K or something like that, and then. Um, yeah, and then and then you just deploy it in a you know however you deploy software. It's just a you know it would be three jar files. It would be two Blingo jar files and your jar file, and you can have as many actor types as you want, and you can spin up as many actors as you may need until memory is full, right? But then if you need some of the other um, concepts like evicting actors from memory, you know, swapping actors in and out and stuff, there, there are some other components that do that for you, so, yeah. Okay. Okay. yeah. yeah. Anyone else? <coughs> okay. Thank you for attending. <laughs>